Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending December 6th. First, let me go back and backtrack on some stuff from last week's show. I got some really great information from two of the viewers, and you guys are the best at bringing these things to my attention. First, from my friend Nigel C., I was talking about ENIAC being the world's first electronic programmable computer. That's not true. I misstated. It is the first electronic programmable general purpose computer. The first actual electronic programmable computer was developed by a British post office engineer called Tommy Flowers. And I'll read you just a little bit from Wikipedia where they compare the ENIAC to the Colossus computer. The ten British Colossus computers used for crypto analysis started in 1943 were designed by Tommy Flowers. The Colossus computers were digital, electronic, and were programmed by plugboard and switches, but they were dedicated to code breaking in that general purpose. Howard Aiken's 1944 Harvard Mark I was programmed by punch tape and used relays. It performed general arithmetic functions but lacked any branching. ENIAC was like the Z3 and Mark I, able to run an arbitrary sequence of mathematical operations but did not read them from a tape. Like Colossus, it was programmed by a plugboard and switches. ENIAC combined full Turing complete programmability with electronic speed. The ABC, ENIAC, and Colossus all used Thermi I don't even know what these are, thermionic valves, vacuum, well, well no, they just told me they're vacuum tubes. ENIAC registers perform decimal arithmetic rather than bi binary arithmetic like the Z3 or the Atenasoff Berry computer. So ENIAC was more of a general purpose computer used for different things, and after they got done using it for artillery trajectory tables, they later on before they took it apart and basically discarded it, used it for nuclear explosions to, to run some uh, uh, programs to calculate what different nuclear explosions, what the effects were and stuff like that. So it was more general purpose. Another way to think about it myself, the best uh, way I could give you kind of an idea, you have a computer inside your car and most modern cars it is a programmable computer. Mine's been reprogrammed for different transmission shifting at the dealer because they thought that would be better and they uh, reprogram it when there's upgrades to software and stuff like that but it's not a general purpose computer you can't make videos on it you can't surf the web you can't uh, do word processing on it play games stuff like that although who knows 20 years from now but yeah it's basically a computer that's attached to the car and dedicated for the car's functions whereas the computer that I'm recording this on is a general purpose computer that could uh, one day do word processing for you and the next day play video games or whatever so that's kind of give you an idea of the difference between the two types of computers. So although ENIAC was not the first electronic programmable computer, it was the first electronic programmable general purpose computer. But uh, definitely if you're talking about the first electronic programmability, um, just programmable computer, definitely the Colossus was the first. So give credit where credit is due. And uh, I also wanted to uh, jump on this too. I saw, saw this too on the... Uh, IFL science researchers closer to using light instead of wires in computers, so we may be seeing sometime in our generation a step from electronic computers to actually computers using light waves instead uh, optical uh, photons can actually carry much more information in a lot better way than electronic circuits can. I'll just uh, read the first paragraph from this. Light is a much more efficient at transmitting data than electricity can through wires, but getting it to work reliably in a computer has been somewhat problematic. A team of engineers have just announced a new optical link device made out of silicon that is able to bend light at right angles, which is an important advancement toward replacing electric wires and computers with optics. The research was led by, I don't know if I'll get this right, Jelena Vukovic of Stanford University. The paper was published in the journal Scientific Reports, and there's a link for that. And as usual, all of the links to all this stuff I will put down below in the description box. But yeah, we're talking about stepping out to the next step of possibly optical computers coming down the pipes. Probably not anytime soon, but uh, maybe the next 10 years. That's my guess. Okay, next one. This one comes from, I'm going to do some outer space stuff. Now we're going to switch to outer space. Uh, we have the Orion spacecraft that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But first, let's go with the uh, Pluto project that's been going on for a while. This was sent to me from Bob 1954 Shadow on uh, they wo they woke it up um, I'm, this report is December 6th end of the week report which is the day they woke this up and I'm making this on December 7th so they woke it up on December 6th I'll just read a little bit of this from NASA NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is set to awake on December 6th yesterday 
for the last of its 18 hibernation periods and prepare for its initial approach towards Pluto, which will take place on January 15th. So that's coming up fairly soon. The spacecraft is scheduled to come as close as 6,200 miles from the surface of Pluto on July 14th, 2015, the closest any man-made object has come to the dwarf planet. The mission sparks the first visit outside Neptune's orbit to the Kuiper Belt, which consists of Pluto and thousands of objects that have not yet been identified, according to Spaceflight Now, a space news website. So, yeah, we're getting closer to actually getting a close-up view of Pluto. And uh, since then, you know, we've discovered Pluto has a lot more moons than just Charon. So that's going to be, uh, we might discover Pluto has a lot more moons than we expected it to have. Who knows? But, yeah, that's scheduled to take place. And now let's get back on to the um, Orion, the Orion spacecraft. Uh, they did delay it the first day. I think it was, was it Thursday? Thursday they were going to have it, and then some valves, uh, the indicators didn't show that the valves had properly opened. So rather than take any chances, they just shut it down for the day and went to the next day, which was Friday, but it was early in the morning, so I missed it. But I got I may be off by a day on these, but I'll, anyway, uh, what happened was uh, I did, Navy Thomas actually sent me a link, and I'll put it down here below to the YouTube video of the takeoff, and uh, it was really spectacular. In fact, everything from takeoff to splashdown worked better than could even have been anticipated. It was uh, so close to uh, perfect, it was astonishing, and I'm glad it shows that we're taking the first step to get back into the actual uh, sending astronauts up and, you know, being able as the U.S. to send astronauts up into outer space. They blasted up to around 3,600, 3,700 miles into outer space, way above where the space station resides. And the purpose of that was so they could get a fast enough trajectory down into the Earth's atmosphere to do an exact recreation of what it would be like if astronauts did come back from, say, Mars, the Moon, visiting an asteroid out in deep space. They wanted to get an exact re-entry modeling of how this would work without astronauts being inside. So this time the capsule was loaded with all kinds of sensors and devices and things like that. But uh, it looks like had actual astronauts been inside and they set it up for that, it would have been actually um, an absolutely fine flight. So we're looking at maybe, I don't know, last I heard was maybe a schedule for Mars in the 2030s, something like that for NASA. But I'm going to put two links down below. First, the link of the takeoff because I had to watch it in the replay too. And then I'll put the link after that of kind of a summary of the whole thing with some good animation and showing you how the whole flight works from takeoff what happened in the middle part and then what happened in splashdown so kind of like a little summary neither one of them are very long videos so they're just quite short videos but they're kind of interesting to watch and finally this is from Christina science alert physicist achieves superconductivity at room temperature uh, let me bring this up here give me a second Okay, now what this is, is it's superconduct. it is obviously superconductivity at room temperature, but it's not quite exactly like you think. They haven't done it. Don't start thinking of taking all the wires out of your house and rewiring your house for electricity with almost zero resistance so you get a, a better electric bill or get more efficient use of your uh, devices in your house. We're far from that, but uh, what it is is it's using some kind of a laser assist um, and it's using some special material. I'll just read a few paragraphs in the middle on this one. One ceramic material called yttrium barium copper oxide has since been singled out thanks to its great potential for use in a range of technical applications such as superconducting cables, electrical motors, and generators made from super thin double layers of copper oxide material stacked in between layers made from barium copper and oxygen. This material is designed to allow the bonding of electrons into what's known as Cooper pairs, the term reported in a press release. These Cooper pairs of electrons are able to tunnel between the alternating layers like ghosts can pass through walls, figurative, figuratively speaking, a typical quantum effect. Um, if you've studied quantum science, you know that uh, electrons can move right through a solid object or appear to move right through a so solid object, and that's called tunneling. But it was thought that this could only occur at super cooled temperatures, but then the physicists from Max Planck decided to see what would happen if they irradiated the YBCO ceramic material with infrared laser pulses. They found that for a fraction of a second, the ceramic becomes superconductive at room temperature. And when they say a fraction of a section, we mean a fraction. It was only a few millionths of a millionth of a second. So that's a very, very brief lifespan for our amazing new room temperature semiconductor. However, the successful Experiment is proof of that such a thing is possible. So yeah, it's a proof of concept right now, and they've proved it can be done for a fraction of a second. So now it's you know what can they do in engineering and stuff like that to make it last a little bit longer or, or put it to a practical use. But hey, um, 
I thought it was going to be a lot much longer before they would have actually have anything that would super conduct that would be super conductive in any shape or form at room temperature. I thought we were still years away, so they've at least accomplished something, and I give them credit for for that work. Credit is due. So anyway, thank you for all of the viewers that help out, that give me the articles, that give me the corrections and things like that. I really appreciate it. Oh, one last thing I want to go over to, one last correction. Don't want to skip this one. My friend Robert Bangalore Bobble um, wanted me to um, remember that when I was talking about computer backups and backing up your hard drives, backing up your data files and stuff like that, I totally skipped over the fact of actually doing your backups of your actual physical documents. And that is really most important. I'll just read a little bit. Thanks, Chuck. Interesting as always. This is from Robert Bangalore Bobble about the backup thing. Yes, very important, but one should not forget also to backup one's most important paper documents. Best case, doing that digitally so one can have copies from same as you did on your digital external hard drive or the cloud. Sounds maybe strange, but what you told about fire may happen to your documents as well, or any calamities, earthquakes, tornadoes, robberies, etc., etc. Papers, documents can also get lost during relocation or moving. I've had that happen myself too. So I highly recommend also back up your most important paper documents. Yes, by scanning them, or if you have a lot of them to back up, just take a high quality picture of them, really. Set up your uh, camera on a tripod, mount it to the floor, and focus it and everything like that, and just lay each one down and click, 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 click. You'll have some good enough uh, quality to be able to, you know, recreate what the document was. Now, I, I realize, and a lot of people may bring this up, yes, if you take, if you have digital copies of your passport or your birth certificate or something like that, sure, they will not accept that the same as the original document. You still will have to, you know, get new original documents, but I think it will help you, you know, retrieve those documents or retrieve new copies of them as the needs may be. So thank you, uh, Robert, for for bringing that up, too. So I do not mind. In fact, I welcome corrections. Any Anytime I get something wrong, or don't uh, mention something or leave something out, uh, please let me know about that. And thank you for continuing to send in more and more links. It uh, makes my show a lot easier to do. So that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.